This is your drug classification video. So looking here, we have a bunch of key terms that you are going to have to have an understanding of basically what they are. I don't want you guys to be, you know, pharmacists or anything, but have an idea what these drugs um, are and do. So looking here, drugs are categorized under classification. So all the drugs are in different classifications. So drugs deal with several types of therapeutic effects and fit under several uh, classifications so they can go across different classifications. A drug may be classified by the chemical type or the active ingredient or by the way it is used in a particular condition. So each drug can be classified into one or more drug classifications. Cardiac medications. Okay, so they encompass a broad class of agents used to treat cardiovascular pathologies. So there's antiarrhythmic, which um, affects electrical conduction of the heart. There's antihypertensive, which is lowering the blood pressure. And there's diuretics, which help eliminate extra fluid within the patient. With all the drugs, there's a chance for allergic reaction. So um, you have to be careful. You need to pay attention to your patient, especially if we're giving a contrast medium. So a patient can have a reaction to contrast and you need to be aware of what you need to do to help that patient. So be vigilant for the signs of allergic reaction and anaphylaxis. Antiarrhythmic um, drugs, so affect the electrical conduction of the heart. The goal is to suppress excessive electrical conduction within the heart and decrease antiarrhythmias or dysrhythmias. Um, as, um, as a group, they act to block the SAAV, the bundle of his, and the electrical membrane um, current within the myocardial cells. They work by blocking various electro, um, electrolyte channels such as sodium, calcium, potassium, or by blocking the beta receptors located within the myocardium. And lidocaine is one that we typically use. There's Levitol also. Anti-hypertensive drugs, so assisting in lowering blood pressure. So lowering um, blood pressure by causing um, vasodilation dilation and decreased heart rate and decreases sympathetic nerve outflow from the CNS. It decreases sodium and water retention or in inhibition of the RAAS through effects of vasodilation. dilation. So affects the effects heart failure in a positive way by decreasing the pressure against which the heart has to pump against. So allowing a failing heart to be more um, efficient without tiring itself out. So um, the two examples of the drugs are Verapamil and uh, Diltazam. Talzin? Mm -hmm. All right. Cardiac glycosides. So uh, digoxin. It's a heart failure med medication. It increases the force of the con uh, contraction of the heart. It stimulates the release of calcium. Um, it also acts as to block the AV node in the heart, so patients with atrial fibrillation do not experience too many adverse beats from the atrium to the ventricle, and the IV medication um, can be dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and we use those to increase the um, blood pressure. Lipid lowering medication, so lowering serum cholesterol levels to assist in long-term life enhancement for patients with coronary syndromes or uh, hypercholesterolemia, so um, levostatin and uh, niacin. Diuretics, aka water pills, uh, because they cause the patient to pee or urinate. So they eliminate excess fluid and sodium from the bloodstream, thus decreasing the overall pressure within the vessel. Overuse or improper use can lead to dehydration and kidney failure. So you need to make sure that um, you talk to the patients because our contrast medium can cause dehydration also. So if they're taking diuretics and you're giving them contrast, you have to make sure that they stay well hydrated. Anticoagulant or antiplatelet and thromboletic medications. So patient receiving any of these medications are at risk for bleeding. That's the key thing. In most cases, such as with the thrombolytics, um, severe bleeding can lead to hemorrhagic stroke. So you need to be conscious and aware 
that they're taking these and watch for the signs and symptoms of an evolving stroke so that you can report it and they can get help right away. Antiplatelet medication, so used in patients who have experienced an acute ischemic event to the heart or brain. Um, in the past, platelets are one of the initial um, instigators of blood clot formation, so physicians prescribe antiplatelet drugs to prevent the portion of the clot cascading. So aspirin is one of the most um, prescribed. Thrombolytic medication used to actively break up a new formed clot, such as those found in the patients with myocardial infar infarction, acute stroke, um, secondary to blood clot or lower leg ischemia, um, usually caused by a blood clot. And um, so we use, if a patient has recently been given an agent in this class, they're at risk or really high risk for bleeding internally and externally. So they don't have the platelets, platelets to stop the bleeding. So you have to be very, very careful. So use caution with all IV sites. Do not start an IV on these patients without physician's orders. So really, really important that um, they come down uh, from the floor with an IV already in place and make sure that um, you don't hurt them at all or start a new IV because they can actually bleed out because there's no platelets to stop it. All right, analgesics. So prescribe more than any other medication in the market. Treat both acute and chronic pain, such as arthritis, headaches, muscle spasm, cancer, surgical and trauma pain, nerve pain, in some cases, anxiety. So subclasses of analgesics is narcotics, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so NSAIDs, and muscle relaxants and acetaminophen. Narcotic medication. So it simulates the CNS receptors. Opioid uh, receptors decrease pain, and at least pain perception. Uh, potential allergies is physical and um, psychological addiction. So um, really addictive uh, respiratory depression can occur. And you can use um, naloxone um, is a drug of choice to immediately reverse respiratory um, depressant effects. So these patients just stop breathing. So a highly regulated class to prevent abuse. So that's your fentanyl, morphine, um, hydromorphine, hydrocodone, oxycodone, and uh, oxycodone. So those are the ones that um, the patients that are overtaking and dying. So it's very, very sad. All right, NSAIDs. So to treat pain associated with the inflammation from arthritis, vasculitis, muscle tears, broken bones, surgical incision, or trauma wounds, um, they relieve pain by inhibiting chemicals responsible for stimulating a nor, uh, uh, no receptor, so a pain receptor. Some uh, cause platelet dysfunctions and and place a risk for bleeding. So ulceration of the stomach and the kidney uh, and, and kidney failure is the adverse effects. So we're talking about ibuprofen, which is morphine and naproxen. Muscle relaxant medications. Treat pain associated with muscle spasms used in um, alignments such as whiplash, spinal cord injury, or muscle spasms or strains. Um, if a patient is acutely ill, these drugs may affect their breathing by decreasing the strength of the external muscles of, resp um, of respiration from the diaphragm. So be careful with those. Acetaminophen, probably the most common uh, algesic in use today, is contained in almost all pain medication combinations, and it is in a subclass by itself. It's believed to uh, inhibit pro, uh, prostaglandins in the CNS, which are responsible for pain production. Acetaminophen is a low potency pain reliever and must not exceed 4,000 milligrams per day because it's associated with liver damage in high dose. So long term use of high dose can cause renal and cardiac damage. So I know people that are in renal failure from taking too much acetaminophen. Crazy. Antihistamine medications. So block histamine from producing adverse effects such as itching, inflammation, respiratory distress, and just overall reactions. So this is one of your first line of defense um, when you're having a patient that's reacting to your contrast medium. So um, 
common antihistamines, um, Benadryl. So that's the one that we typically give patients if they're starting to itch or break out in hives or anything with the contrast, we'll give them uh, Benadryl to take home and take it when they get there. Unless they have a driver, we'll give it to them right then. The newest form of antihistamine is much less sedating, um, but not typically used in uh, radiology. So, and that's your Allegra, Claritin, or Zyrtec. They are quite sedating, but may lead to respiratory depression when used with um, algesics. So, endocrine medications. Those diabetic and hyperthyroidism are two common endocrine problems for which patients frequently receive drug treatment. Anti-diabetic medications are required for patients who have difficulty maintaining proper balance between blood sugar and tissue sugar. So insulin dependent. So that's uh, diabetes mellitus type 1 refers to patients who have uh, little or no circulating um, endogenous uh, insulin. So non-insulin dependent is diabetes type 2 refers to patients who have sufficient circulating um, ingenuous insulin but poor receptor sensitivity to the insulin. So types of insulin, there's ultra short acting, short acting, intermediate, long, and ultra long acting. So things you should remember and ensure. Patients taking insulin may, be, uh, may require regular meals so that the blood sugar doesn't drop dangerously low, which can lead to seizures and a comatose state. Be aware of patients receiving metformin because this drug should be held before and after for 48 hours from receiving contrast. <clears throat> if metformin is not uh, withheld, the patient is at risk for severe metabolic acidosis secondary to metformin metab metabolic accumulation. So what it does is it basically shuts down the kidneys. So make sure if they're taking metformin, it's actually one of the questions on your screening forms, make sure that they're not taking their metformin after the injection of contrast. Thyroid medication it is used to regulate um, the metabolic process in the body. So lack or excess of this hormone can present many different types of pathologies. So thyroid hormone is used to treat hypothyroidism that is either primary because of lack of indigenous uh, thyroid hormone production or secondary to removal or obliter obliteration of the thyroid gland. Okay, CNS medications. Drugs that affect the brain and spinal cord and produce a response that could be used to alleviate or treat a particular condition. So there's anti-seizure, anti-psychotic, antidepressive, and anti-anxiety. So anti-convulsant to prevent or reduce the severity and frequency of surgeries, so surgeries, seizures. Some patients require multiple anti-seizure medications to prevent frequent attacks which can become fatal if the patient loses the ability to oxygenate for long periods of time. The goal of these medications is to stop activity and prolong intervals between each seizure event. Antipsychotic medications, so treat psychosis, especially schizophrenia, uh, paranoid behaviors, hallucinations, disillusions, bipolar, um, affective disorder, acute agitation, antisocial behaviors, and mania. So these medications generally take weeks to months to reach their full effect. So some patients present to the department with paranoid dissolutions. So um, you have to keep in mind that this may be part of their normal behavior as well as the new onset of a CNS pathology. So you've got to rule out something new. All right. <clears throat> Antidepressive medication treat clinical depression that results from neurotransmitter deficiencies. They enhance the CNS levels and of uh, serotonin and norepinephrine, which elevates the depressed mood into a more normal state. They require weeks of therapy to become active. Anti-anxiety medications. So we use a lot of anti-anxiety medications within uh, MRI so that patients are able to get the scans done. Or if we're doing a biopsy, we'll also um, go ahead and give them some anti-anxiety if they're really nervous. They treat acute and chronic anxiety states. They act on the limbic system, enhancing the effect of this sedative neurotransmitter. 
Um, RTs frequently encounter this class because the patients require um, sedative to alleviate anxiety secondary to claustrophobia, typically in CT and MRI. And we usually give diazepam or lorazepam. And the doctor, the radiologist, will tell you how much to give the patient or they'll give it themselves. All right, anti-infectious agents. So it includes antibiotics, antivirals, and antifungals. These medications sub subclasses act at the cellular level to destroy, inhibit, and suppress the cell wall, enzymatic activity, or ribosomal or DNA functions uh, of the invading microorganism. So antibiotics are used to kill or suppress pathologic microorganisms responsible for infectious diseases such as, we use penicillins, that's the most um, common. Antifungal are agents used to kill mycotic or fungal organisms. And we have antivirals are used to suppress and limit the spread or shedding of viruses that invade the body. Chemotherapy agents, all right. So toxic compounds designed to kill off rapidly growing cells by altering or destroying the stages in cellular division. So precaution should be taken with all chemotherapy patients so that no medication touches the exposed skin of the healthcare worker. So coming into physical contact with these medications puts the healthcare worker at um, increased risk of serious side effects, including the simulation of cancerous conditions, which is crazy. Even coming into contact with bodily fluids into which the chemotherapy is secreted, such as urine, can pose potential threat to the clinicians. So use universal precautions and there's special chemotherapy gloves um, and gowns that should be worn when dealing with uh, chemotherapy drugs. So really, really important that um, if the patient is on chemotherapy and they urinate or throw up or whatever, you need to make sure that you protect yourself because it's um, very, very, very potent and will get you sick. So herbal products, self-treating using herbal products has become uh, common. Uh, they have a broad scope of herbal self-treatment and can be associated with dangers that the consumer doesn't even understand. So if you're taking herbal products and you're mixing it with normal medications, it can have a toxic effect. So um, always ask your doctor and talk to your doctor about herbal products before you take them. So medical professionals should not overlook this possibility that their patients are using such products. Various adverse effects as well as serious drug-drug interactions can affect the cardiovascular gastrointestinal tract and CNS when herbal products are taken in excess or when products are not standardized with um, uh, regard to their content. So uh, ginkgo biola, St. John's wort, garlic, um, I'm using turmeric right now, so I'd be, I was sure to tell my doctor that I am taking turmeric. So really important that you share that with your doctor and um, they're aware of what you're taking because some of them may not be compatible with um, medications that you're currently on. Okay, so that's your lecture. Hope you enjoyed it and um, don't worry about the names of the drugs. Um, I would pay attention to your anti-anxiety and then just know each class of drugs and kind of what they do. Good job and I will have your tests for you on Monday.